Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is my good friend, uh, John Rulin. Uh, John is the author of the book, Giftology, and the founder of the Rulin Group, uh, a gift logistics company to help clients like the Chicago Cubs, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, the John Maxwell Company. Basically, if you are legit and you use gifts as part of your business, they help you execute that gifting strategy. Uh, John is a legendary, I'm talking legend, like number one out of 1.5 million reps at Cutco, which some people th hear Cutco and they think that's amazing. The best sales organization possible, or I don't know, maybe some people don't like it. I think it's one of the, it's an amazing organization full of amazing, ta amazingly talented people. And so kind of taking sales skills and relationship building skills and applying those to uh, those skills to, to, to books and to business. So today we're going to be talking about how to use a book uh, to grow relationships and to increase referrals uh, for your business. I think John's one of the, just one of the best at doing this and, and walking the walk uh, with his book. So John, great to have you here. Hey Chandler, thanks for having me, brother. Hey, so let's, let's start with this. Why did you write the book Giftology? And I mean, it is just a core part of your business and it feels like this book was planting the flag, but why write the book and why is it such a core part of your business? Yeah, well, I think that uh, one of the reasons we, and I talked about writing it for a long time because people were asking for it. You know, like I had no, I had no desire when I started the business, when I interned with Cutco. I had my buddies like Hal Elrod and others that were like authors and speakers and I, I hated speaking and I couldn't see actually writing a book because I was like, you know, who cares about gifts? Like they're really, anybody going to be on my grandma going to buy a book? about gifts, but I think I had enough clients that started to hire me to speak and the responses to the stories were good. And then we got asked to be on podcasts and I'm like, you know, I can't speak everywhere. I can't do every podcast and I don't really want to travel that much. So I was like, my business partner really was like, if we're going to be the thought leader and, and own this space, John, you got to suck it up and get over the imposter syndrome and, and write the book because this could go places we can't go and legitimize, you know, like, you know, the gifting as like a marketing, you know, tool, like idea, it, it'll legitimize it. So um, we, we debated on it for a long time, but finally, five years ago, we buckled down and did it. Nice. And what was the trigger moment for you to take it? Because I think so many people can relate. Writing a book is a maybe next year, maybe someday thing. Yeah. What was, what was the trigger for you to say, no, this is important now uh, for my business and for me personally? Well, I think that uh, we were trying to get on stages and I was, you know, in most cases, you know, I get paid maybe five grand to speak. But a lot of times I was speaking for free or begging to speak for free. And I just, you know, I started to have more kids. Like I, at the time I had two and a third daughter on the way. And I was like, I just can't go speak more. I need a play. I need something to go out there and really take people from, you know, oh, gifting, oh, that's a nice check the box thing, warm, fuzzy, maybe I'll get around to it too. Like I wanted people to really take it seriously and, and you know, own uh, that this is a, a core part of relationship building because nobody cares about gifts, but everybody cares about relationships, but really it just sounded like a sales pitch. And then we talked to, you know, I went to mastermind talks and started to see other people speak about the power of their book and, you know, the referrals that they got, and the doors they got open and how much, you know, people that weren't as good a speaker as I was were charging more than I was. So I'm like, this is just like, we got to suck this up. And then eventually we, we cut the check to decide like, hey, we're going to spend this money on the book launch. And then we invited people to a book launch to a book that didn't even exist. And that was the line in the sand. Because when you invite your customers to something, <laughs> to something, and, and that, I'll give credit to my business partner, who's like really the CFO, COO, like he's really more of the like, you know, I'm the relationship, vision, marketing, creativity mm -hmm. guy. He's the like boots on the ground, like let's stay in reality. And he's like, if we invite people, we're going to get it done. And, uh, and sure enough, six months later, the book was done. Uh, it wasn't necessarily fully printed the way that I wanted it to be printed in all the copies. So we, we did paperback, which I don't really like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when you invite people to something for a book launch, you better have a book or else you're going to look stupid. Wild. And so that, so you paid money, put a deposit down, said, Hey, we're doing a launch party and you hadn't even started, uh, writing the book. Mm -mm. That's awesome. And, and, and that was the impetus. That's great. Parkinson's law, right? An object will solve uh, in, in, to the amount of time or space that you, you give it. So you, you kind of put the deadline there. There's so many things I want to unpack here. I want to circle back to the speaking stuff. I want to circle back if we have time to even 
uh, the high quality printing. Like there's so many things, but let's talk marketing for a sec. I want to go marketing business and kind of tie it all together. You know, it's, it's years later. I feel like you're, you've got momentum rolling. Looking back, what are the, what are the two or three things that have really moved the most copies of the book? And why do you, why do you feel like this book sold so well? Yeah. Well, one of the things is the first 50 copies we made were $250 a piece. I believed that most people do the wrong thing when they write, write a book. There's 30,000 books published on Amazon every week. Most of them sell less than 300 copies. And I was like, I will not be that guy. I, I want my book to impact a million people, not 300 people. So if, if, if you write something and it's your life's work, it should be your Bible. Like, it, like you think about the Bibles that were printed like 200 years ago, they were like handmade out of leather and they were like gorgeous because it was like God's word. Like it's a big deal. And if it like, if you worked on something for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever. So, and, and people, authors, you see this, like they brag about how cheap they print their book. And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing in the planet. Like this should be like, you know, everybody's got the should read of like 37 books. I don't want mine just to look cool. I want it to be read. So I made it for guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and Seth Godin and John Maxwell and Michael Hyatt, either clients, friends, or people I respected from afar. And, uh, and, and the reason this was so important is I mailed this off. I didn't ask for a blurb. I didn't ask them to promote it. I just said, thank you. So I, each copy, handmade out of leather, monogrammed to them and their spouse. Like I followed giftology to a T in a leather bag, monogrammed in a linen box with a metal letterhead written with a Sharpie. 250 bucks. People made fun of me. I got Michael Hyatt reached out. He said, John, I get four to 5,000 books sent to me every year. I've been in publishing for 40 years. Not only did I read your book, my wife, Gail, read your book and I ordered 25 copies for my team and they all read the book. So what I would say about marketing is most people where everybody goes cheap, I go expensive and where everybody goes expensive, I go cheap. So I try to find the areas like that's why gifting works is most people spend 20 bucks. I spend 200 or 2000. Most people will spend all their money on Facebook ads and, you know, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but $250 doesn't even buy us a round of drinks in Austin or, you know, California or anywhere. Like, and so I'd rather spend $250 on one person versus spend whatever, a dollar on everybody, you know, on 250 people. And so that, that to me, that got like Darren Hardy to talk about the book that got me, that got Michael Hyatt to ask me onto the podcast. That got, not because I was asking, I was planting seeds and playing the long game. And so I think my marketing plan was I talked to Hal uh, Elrod from Miracle Morning, who's a you know, mutual friend of ours. And he said, John, I didn't pick up momentum on the book until like year five. So commit to a five-year launch plan and do one to three things that are book related every single week. And if you do that, like things will work. And so I just look for those angles and like, when I saw how well the 50 worked, I started ordering that $250 book a thousand at a time. Now they didn't cost 250 bucks. They were still expensive. I call my hundred dollar VIPs. And anytime somebody I'm sending a book after a conversation, I'm not sending the paperback or even the hardcover that's on Amazon. I'm sending the hundred dollar VIP. And, and you know, if you, now I have a, it's a 2.0 version, and a 3.0 version. Like I keep ratcheting up what we're doing because I feel like most people, it's like the flavor of the month. And then they're on to the next thing. And I'm like, this is evergreen, man. Like, this is my anchor. Uh, and so I'm constantly thinking about how to, to the point where my friends who are CEOs, we talk about Brad Weimer, who runs Easy Pay, is like, dude, you were a shameless promoter of giftology. And it came out in 2016. He had this conversation last week. And it's like, that's one of the core parts of my entire business model is getting people to recognize that we're the leaders across the world. And we've been... Even though we're a small company, billion dollar companies are reaching out, buying the book or wanting to collaborate with us because of how it's perceived in the marketplace. I'm so great. I love the long-term view and the five-year marketing plan. I love that you touched on that and going deep, not wide. How do you, so you've got these multiple versions, like upscale version of the, uh, of the book, and it's kind of the Trojan horse to start conversations, to build relationships. A lot of things we'll, we'll be talking about later in this interview. How do you decide who to send those books to? And, and very candidly, like if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm someone at home thinking, all right, well, I've got a limited budget. And all right, for some people, I want to just like send them a, just a regular copy. And if, and if I go this upgraded route, Like, all right, this is like, how do you distinguish between the two or do you just send everyone the high-end book? I mean, personally, I don't, I don't send anything other than the, 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 at least the entry-level VIP, the $100 VIP. 
and the reason is, is like any one of your prospects, if they came to town, you'd likely take them to lunch or dinner. If you get some FaceTime or whatever else, it costs you a hundred bucks. Like in general, and that's not scalable. Not only did it cost you a hundred bucks, of your, but it costs you whatever your time's worth. As a consultant, our time's worth $50 an hour, hundred dollars an hour. Like as a speaker, like I've been paid upwards of a hundred grand to speak for 60 minutes. So like, to me, if I can invest, 50 or hundred bucks or 200 bucks and get like somebody to think of me differently. I think that's the thing is there's like, I would rather shoot with a laser, you know, rifle versus like the, most people are doing the shotgun approach. And so the other thing is, is I've turned that into a profit center. I have people now that are wanting like Dan Martell is wanting to send out books to different people. Well, he's willing to buy the books because they're, they're so they're packaged so nicely He's like, I would love to send that out to people. So we've actually turned, but most people, the book is like a lost leader. And, but I've been able to do both. And like, yes, we give away a lot of copies, a couple thousand a year, but I also sell like we've, you know, we're upwards of a hundred thousand copies sold, which, you know, for the book that, you know, that's not like, you know, we're not Malcolm Gladwell here. We're not JK Rowling. Like it's a lot of books. Um, and so I, I think that understanding the real value of a referral or a lead or a deal and, and everybody say that, you know, every, it's cool because of Vaynerchuk to say we play the long game. Most people's long game is days. My long game is decades. And so I know like if I send that book, it, they might not be even relevant to them, but it's hard to throw away a hundred dollar book. You know, it's hard to weigh, throw away a $3 business card. It's like, we, I love the things that make it hard and are sticky because that likelihood of them passing it on to somebody else that, and then they look cool if, even if they pass it on because of how it's packaged. It's, it's so funny you mentioned that. I'm literally in the process of moving right now. And the hardest thing for me uh, uh, about moving is figuring out what I'm going to do with so many books. <laughs> it's like, man, I got, I can fit my clothes in a couple boxes, but I got boxes and boxes and boxes of books. So I'm figuring out, okay, okay, well, how do I figure out which books to throw out and all that stuff? But anyways, I'm, I've got this, you know, kind of this figuring out to throw away pile and wouldn't you know it, I've got all these books and bubbling up to the top, two copies of Giftology. Because <laughs> it's the nicest, highest quality book I have. <laughs> and so it, it, it bubbles up and it's like, all right, well, hold up. I can't throw that away. Like, it could, is there someone on my team that I could give it to? Like, you know, which now all of a sudden, within what we're talking about, I am actively referring you business just by feeling guilty to throw away the book because it's so nice. It's silly. It's silly. It's, but it's because if everybody published that level of book, it would be noise. It'd be marketing noise. Just like if everybody takes everybody out to steak dinners or golf or sponsors events and all this stuff, none of those things are wrong, but most of those things are table stakes. So I think the question I'm always asking myself, like even our hardcover, I'm like, how do I up level this hardcover? And, um, and one of the things we're like, I want somebody to, even if they don't read the book, I want them to, to be on our, our email page. So now I spend, I spend like five bucks on metal um, bookmarks. They have a leather tassel. They're beautiful. They're like our business cards. I feel like five bucks for a bookmark. That's a lot of money. And I'm like, really? Like, what's a lead worth? What's somebody on your email list that could be a client worth? Like, it's, uh, and, yeah. and what's funny is that bookmark, I've seen people posting and sharing it on social yeah. because it's like, this is like the nicest bookmark I've ever seen. Uh, in a book, nobody has a bookmark. If they do, it's cheap, yeah. it's what flimsy yeah. it's paper. And so, like going all in on the details is like the way to be able to like rise above and bubble to the surface all, all the time. I mean, I love that small example too. Because when's the last time you got given a bookmark? Maybe years, maybe by your grandma maybe, twenty yeah. years ago. Right. And so now though, if there's someone like me reading 50 books a year, well, every book that they read, they're going to think of you, not just when they read your book. Right. Cause I've been using the same bookmark for years. And I feel like that's probably the same when you give out these books is people get that. It's so nice. They're like, all right, well, I'm going to ditch my one other bookmark that I have. And now this is my go-to bookmark. And every time they see it, uh, they, th they think of you subconsciously I even. Yeah. Yes. Hey, you've got over 600 reviews on this, this book on Amazon. How'd you do that? Any tips? Um, write a good book. You know, it's helpful. Uh, and then I would say um, ask. 
but you don't ask like most people ask too soon and you probably teach mm. this it's like and phil jones i think teaches it as well it's like when somebody compliments the book you say thank you you say what did you learn you know what was helpful what did you take away you know what was like what was the nuggets of course they oftentimes now you're in a dialogue they respond and um and if you do that once or twice then you say hey probably don't have time but if you have 37 seconds you know one of the best things you can do is what you just put there was incredible if you'd take the time to leave that exactly where you said it is perfect on amazon it makes an impact on other people finding it and the amount of people that have never left a review for any book before but they leave one for giftology is super high because i didn't go for the kill right away and i actually take the time personally on my own social accounts to do that and um and to me like you know, people judge a book by its cover. They do judge, they're like 650 some reviews. Are you kidding? Like, like there's books that have sold way more books than mine that have way less reviews. So it's like anything else. Like I want to play at like a king level and there's a handful of markers that you can control. And that's one of them that I think a lot of people like, they just think, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. I got over a hundred. I'm like, that's cool. hundred's cool. You know, my mark, my, my next mark is I, I, I want to be a, a comma. I love the comma. Get me to a thousand, baby. You know, and, <laughs> and, then, and then Hal's got like three or 4,000. I'm like, I can't compete with that, but <clears throat> I, you know, I'm on my way. Yeah, that's great. I love that. And <laughs> magic words, Kent, would you mind taking two seconds to copy and paste that into a review? Here's the link just the amount the it's so simple but it's the amount of reviews that you get from that is i think really powerful let's talk switching gears a little bit to the business side we already touched on this a good bit but can you unpack it at, at a high level what is the giftology method uh, and how can authors use this methodology to sell more books to grow their business yeah well, I alluded to the beginning. I mean, nobody wakes up at 4 a.m. doing their miracle morning and being like, oh man, if I just got my gifting strategy together, I'd just like, my business would flourish. But the simple fact is whether you're an author, speaker, you know, billion dollar company, every business, every author, every speaker, they're like, their business rises and falls on relationships. It could be relationships with media, influencers, authors, event planners, CEOs, clients, employees, like it's human beings. And most of the time, people, if, you're on, if they're honest with themselves, they suck at showing gratitude consistently to the relationships that matter. They just don't have, a, you ask them what their marketing plan is, their business plan is, like maybe they have it, maybe they don't. You ask them what their relationship plan is and nobody has one. So the core of what we teach is, you know, instead of just spending money on Facebook ads or whatever else, you should have a program. You should reinvest. Our, our methodology is five to 15% of net profits back into your relationships to keep them, to grow them and to turn them into sales reps. And part of that gifting budget for us is books. That's why we spend so much on the book. It's like, if we're going to do a gift, it's not going to be a tchotchke with some logo on it. It's going to be a really thoughtful gift. It's going to include their family. It's, you know, like when I send, you know, gifts to certain people, like I always include their spouse or their assistant. And so, I mean, if your tribe wants to know what our blueprint is of like how we think about, you know, gifting year round, how much to spend, who to take care of, then go to giftologysystem.com and literally download our entire playbook of what we charge tens of thousands to take companies through. Um, but the methodology is the same. Even if like I have author buddies that are speakers that will use us to outsource their gifting to because they're like, they have their top 50 or their top 100. And so what I would say is like, you know, figure out like if you're a consultant and you made a hundred grand last year, you should be, you know, reinvesting five to 15 grand back into those people. That means you get to keep 85 grand and the people you're investing in bought their own gifts or they bought their own book, but you're actually like making it a math equation to think through. And the goal is not like just to feel good. Like the goal would be next year, you should do 150 grand. Like it should, you plant seeds and you know, whether you believe in a God or not, like God's taught us like if you invest in you know plant seeds you reap what you sow and oftentimes it's 10x or 100x but most people like they hold back they play scared they play scarcity mindset and because of that they they miss out on what could happen if they went all in versus like playing mediocre to the masses that's so great you have in in line with this and you talked about um you know the system as a whole I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly, you got kind of a controversial view on Christmas gifts. 
oh, or man. holiday <laughs> gifts and stuff like that. Can you touch on that? Because I think sometimes when people think gifts, they think, oh, birthday, Christmas, anniversary, insert, yeah. you know, Valentine's, whatever else. Like, can you differentiate between the yeah. two and, and kind of share your, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I uh, we've been written up in like New York Times as like the Grinch that wants to kill Christmas, <laughs> which is ironic for a gifting agency, you know, yeah. like somebody that, you know, that helps people do done for you gifting. And it's not that I'm anti gratitude, generosity, I'm anti obligation and expectations. So I think the worst time to give a gift, I say no ABC gifting. So no anniversaries, birthdays, Christmas, if you have a wife or a significant other, and you only take care of that person on anniversaries, Valentine's Day, Christmas, like those are table stakes. Like you don't earn brownie points. That's just like kind of expected. Same thing within business. Like if you send out a book at an expected time, like I never tell somebody I'm sending them this VIP book. Why? You ruin half the impact of the gift, which is the, you know, it's the Ritz Carlton mindset, surprise and delight. If it's expected, if you give a gift after a deal's done, after a referral is given, you know, like, hey, I want to be one of the 50 gifts that's ready to clap somebody's table at Christmas. Frick, no, I, I don't want to be competing with anybody. So the best time to send a gift is just because. The best time to send a book is just because. And so I, I see so many people that will send out, you know, books at launch time. They'll send out 50 or 100 or 200 books. They're sent vanilla form letters. And then like six months later, they're not sending out any more books. It's like, are you an idiot? You spent all this time and money to build this tool. Why? Like it should be an ongoing strategy. And if anything, it should be getting better. Like you should be like taking profits and reinvesting it back in to make your book better, your packaging better, your notes. And a lot of times, you know, like I speak to EO and YP all the time, they buy the, the giftology book. I don't give it to them. They pay for it, you know, and it, full price, $25 up to hundred bucks. And then we package it with a, with a gift as well. I call them love bombs, put the gift with the book. And people are like, why would they do that and pay you to speak? And I'm like, cause all these events are virtual now, instead of buying alcohol and paying like, you know, Jimmy Fallon to come, you know, promote or whatever else, like they have money that they are able to reinvest back into other things. And so we're taking the book experience with the gift experience. And I, and we don't give it out at the event. We mail it out. I did it probably 18 times last year for EO, YPO and groups like that. And they get this like two to $500 package showing up. And now people are reading the book before I speak. They're experiencing oftentimes, you know, custom knife set, whatever it is. And, uh, and they get it. And now they're coming to the talk already pre-sold. They're excited. I'm, you know, like I'm able to engage. And we just did an event in EO, for EO. We did this exact same thing. And they said, John, normally we get like a hundred people at like once a year at a holiday party because it's food, alcohol, people are together, they're, they're partying. You know, EO is a bunch of CEOs, entrepreneurs. They're like, John, we got, we have 94 RSVPs to your talk. You know, like the giftology guy, really? Like, why did that happen? Well, they invested in all 180 members. They invested these love bombs and one of them was the book. And so people got it. They're put it on social media. They're curious. And they showed up to the event in record numbers. And it's not like I'm like, you know, the rock, like I don't have like this celebrity status, but the way it showed up made people curious and engaged and wanted to take time to come, come to the event. That's so great, man. I love that. So many great takeaways there. And I wholeheartedly agree. And, and the, when giving becomes an expectation, it's no longer a gift, right? So how do you surprise and delight, like you said, outside of the, the expected? I'll, I'll share this real quick thing. Um, that I think you might actually like. This is super smart. This is the gistology approach, but I just got this. Uh, it's this is this thing from uh, Elevation Church, and it's it's like basically a letter um, from uh, Pastor Stephen. And in it, I'm like, this is so smart. They're really good at marketing. Um, but it says it's this little thing that it says for year for year <laughs> for your ears only, and it's a it looks like a credit card, and it's a uh, but it's a QR code. And you scan it and it's their record that they're that's coming out. And I think now it's a week from now, but they send it out weeks ahead of time. This methodology Free to experience. a T, right? It's surprised 
It's surprising to light. It's unexpected. It's a pre-experience. I feel exclusive and special. I've told so many people about this album that's coming out. There's a, when you scan the QR code, now you can actually pre, I mean, they're smart, right? They, you can pre-buy it. You can pre-save it on Spotify. You can pre all the things. Yeah. And, and there's just so much uh, pent up demand for when this launch is happening. Yep. I bet this, this all in this thing probably cost them a dollar. I mean, this is like the, the cheap version of what you're talking about, uh, yep. but, but wildly but it works. effective. Yeah. It's crazy. Hey, a yeah. couple final questions for you. This is, I could talk all day about this stuff. Um, can you talk about how, how do you strategically use the book to drive referrals? How, how, how do you look at that? When do you put it in the process? You know, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, I, what I'd say is that, um, like we just did something with, with Nick Nanton, who's, you know, like made a bunch of documentaries, just made a documentary with Giovanni, like works with like Tony Robbins. Like he's got a great clientele list. He's somebody that, you know, it'd be one thing to, and he's a client, he sent gifts to the different people and loves what we do. And, you know, the difficult thing is, is making it as easy as possible for somebody to open doors and share, you know, people all like, they don't have time, they don't have time. Like they're just busy. Everybody's busy, especially somebody that's a CEO. And so one of the things I've done is I, you know, I did this with Hal too. I said, Hal, who are the 25 people that are most important in your life that I could make you look really good to that would cost you nothing and will handle everything for you. And I, and I offered to comp the hundred dollar version of the book. And then I also offered to have my team handwrite all the notes. And I gave him wording that he could tweet to make it so he sent out 25 books to a number of people and, um, and wouldn't you know it, so did John Bowen and so did whatever else. So like when I spoke it for Robin Robbins, who's got like a uh, huge, like multi eight figure mastermind, she got the book from three different people that she respected unintentionally from me. And she went from like not knowing who Giftology or John Rulin was to being like, who the hell is John Rulin and how do we get him on our stage? And, and so like that turned into, you know, $30,000 speaking fee. Plus they became a client. Why? Well, I made it easy for other people to brag. And really the bragging was sending out the book, but they didn't have to like pay for the book. In that case, they didn't have to like handwrite the notes, all the things that make it a hassle. We just eliminated all of that and said, Hey, you know, like picture 25 that you want to just have a fun, loving touch point to, and you like the book, you like me, like I just want to make it super easy. And so I do that at least two to three times a month where I'll find somebody, you know, like a you or like a Pete, Pete's done it. Like, and they love it because they get all the text messages like, oh, I love this book or this is packaged so amazing. or like, holy crap. And um, so they look cool. They get all the credit. But then what does it do? It basically is them endorsing. It transfers the social capital and not all of them turn into anything, but if one out of 25 do, it pays for, everything times 10. And so we do that when we've been doing it for a long time and other people like, I think sometimes we'll mimic it maybe once a year, which is fine. But to me, it's like week in, week out, month in, month out. Like I'm, uh, I'm trying to find the right people to be able to honor, offer that to. And, um, and not everybody takes us up on it, but a lot do yeah. and it works. That's so smart. And I, I've, I've seen um, Michael Hyatt do this well. We do this as well. It's not exactly what you're talking about. I think that's even smarter how you're doing it, but a simplified version of um, like we have a self publishing school.com forward slash friend. So we tell our people, it's like, Hey, if you ever know someone, your friend who says, Hey, you're writing a book. How are you doing that? Just send them that link. We'll ship them a book on your behalf. You look cool. And if they sign up for self publishing school, they save money because you send them there. Right. Or like little things like that. I know Hyatt does the same thing with his business accelerator program where it's okay. Know someone that might be a fit for this. Well, the first ask is not like, let us call them It's let us send them a book, a full focus planner, like essentially a love bomb, like you're talking about. Yeah. And so I think it's just so smart to embed that in the referral program process. And then I love what you do and, and kind of how this integrates with, with, uh, you know, a book, it greases the wheels of the sales process because you don't have to spend so much time explaining what you do. The book wow. explains it. And then it greases the wheels of the onboarding process. So it saves your team time because you don't have to 
onboard clients as thoroughly because you can just say, hey, read the book. <laughs> and, and then they're up to speed. So you've got a higher close rate and lower time per client to, to spend onboarding by having the book do the heavy lifting of the methodology for you. Yeah. Smart. Yeah, it's good. I mean, and yeah, you know, and it strengthens a relationship of the person who you want to go out there and talk more about, you know, yeah. like, I think a lot of people have passive referral relationships. And I'm like, if I, if I can turn all of my clients into active referral sources mm. versus passive, most people wait, mm. you know, it's like the, it's like the financial advisor, like, most people's financial advisor only gets referrals when somebody says, Hey, who's your financial guy or versus flipping the script is how do I get my clients to go That's bring so up great. financial yeah. services or books or widgets or insurance or whatever. Like That's most so people, great. it's not inactive. It's a passive process and they miss yeah. out. That's smart. You're making me think right now I'm about to do an update and revised version of published. I'm like, how have I, my most recent book published. And I'm like, how have I not thought about this? I need to send a copy to all of all past clients of SPS as like the, the, the preview copy um, before it, before the new book comes out. That's a great idea. Hey, I'm going to rapid fire a couple more. Cause I I'm just curious about a bunch of things that, that you talked about throughout this. Yeah. You, uh, you talked about, um, you know, creating a high quality book, any tips for authors who want to do that? Um, and, and how can you cost effectively, create a high quality book. I know you have all different kinds, whether it's leather bound, whether there's like the, the red carpet style velvet inside that. I mean, it's, it's, it really is a high quality book. Anything you've learned the hard way or tips on how to make the book feel more quality while also not break, breaking the, breaking the bank while doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, there's some things that like just the material on the outside matters, the simplicity of the design. Like when we did it, we hired a couple different designers because I just didn't like the design. The first you know, person that did the outside cover, I was just like, this just does, feels busy. It did feel kind of bland. Um, and then the other thing is giving yourself permission to keep reiterating. I mean, if you own the rights, the IP, like initially when I published the book, there was a knife on it. There's no knife anymore. And it was like, I don't want to be, you know, like, yes, we do a lot millions of dollars in knives, but I don't want that necessarily to be on the cover. And it felt like maybe over time, it just didn't feel like the level I wanted to be at. And so we took it off. That's the beauty of owning the IP and owning the rights to do it. And so we keep evolving it. But the red, you know, the red lining was something I was like, uh, I think I, I kind of modeled some of the stuff that we did off of Jeffrey Gittimer. Like his books always felt different. They felt higher end. They felt uh, playful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, little red, the little red book of selling. Yeah. And I just wanted wow. that, like almost like a Jimmy Choo shoe. It's like a thousand dollar pair of heels. What's on the bottom? It's red. Yeah. And it was just something that would pop. It was something that was different. And we just looked for ways to say, like, if this was a fashion brand or a Apple product or a, like, if you say you're, you know, like best in class, world class, first class, then like thinking about some of the little details and does it really cost that much to line it with red? No, it might, maybe it's an extra 20 cents or something. I don't know, but the extra cover might be an extra buck. And so like, you know, all in, it, it, it's going to cost you a few dollars more, five dollars more, or ten dollars more. But to me, like, you don't have to be at a hundred dollars in order to have like get like to be. I, what my overall feeling was, I wanted to be nicer than any other traditionally published book mm, because I was nice. like, I want to be playing at the level of the Simon and Schuster's. And actually, I hate dust jackets, so I'm like, I'm going to be better. And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, and that's the beauty of being in 2021 is you can self publish a book and actually be nicer than yes. the billion dollar companies. Yes. So, Hey, how do you use your book to get, uh, to raise your speaking fee and get, to get booked for so many speaking gigs? Cause I feel like it, it, your, your fee is going up so much. And I look at that and, and even, I mean, I do a lot of speaking and I'm like, man, John is at a whole nother level. Like any, any tips for for other, for myself or for other speakers looking to level up their, their speaking fee and inbound speaking requests using a book? Yeah. Well, I would say that, um, you know, similar to what I just said, like, make sure that what you do, like, if it feels like a cheap brochure, then they're not going to take your speaking very seriously because you're like, you're a pitch person versus mm -hmm. you're a sales rep versus, and yeah. I always, I've always said, I'm a business owner who happens to speak and I, and I cap my speaking. I only speak live in person 20 times a year. That makes people say, well, I, I can only, you know, like it gives me the permission to say no. 
it gives me the permission to say that's not the right fit, not right, not right audience. And it lets people know, like, I'm not doing unlimited gigs. And so the book's high end. And part of it is like being just bold enough to say, like, my message and, you know, my craft is worth it. Like, there's a lot of times I see people that are charging 150 grand. Are they, you know, seven times better than somebody that's at like, you know, 20 grand? No, oftentimes they're not but their platform, their notoriety, their boldness, their whatever is like, and so speaking is one of those weird, interesting things is like, you, whatever the price is, the price is. And, and I realized that early on, because when I published the book, I went from five to 10. Did anything change in my speaking or my talk? Nothing. And I increased it by a hundred percent. Why? Because I was like, I, 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 I gave me the confidence to ask for more. And, um, and then I'd also just say, like, you start hanging out with, you know, you or Pete Vargas or, you know, the Jesse Itzlers and the Sarah Blakely's and these kind of people, Darren Hardy, you're like, dang, like those guys are just consistently asking for 50 or hundred or 200 grand or 500 grand. And just by very nature, you're like, I can't ask for 500 grand, but I can ask for 50. Like that's one tenth the amount. And so like, I think that the more you surround yourself by with people that make you feel small, it also raises your game and gives you confidence to be able to ask for what you really feel like you're bringing to the table. That's great. John, what would be your parting piece of advice for, you know, the John from seven years ago, pre book or all the other Johns out there that are thinking about uh, writing and, and publishing their first book, knowing what we, you know, now what would be kind of your parting piece of advice for those folks? Well, I would say that um, if I hadn't uh, drawn the line in the sand and invited people, I would still be tweaking the book. It wouldn't be out. In fact, my wife, who keeps me very humble, like she even said, she's like, John, I, I never would have published Giftology. Like you could have tweaked this and done this differently. Like she was like through her eyes and she's right. The original version could have been better. But I, what I would say is that like, there's definitely like life before the book and life after the book. And I think that, um, you know, if you are playing the long game in decades, then, and you've done something worthy, you've done something that's worth writing about, you've done something and, and don't just judge. Sometimes we have imposter syndrome, but if other people are like, your stuff is really good and I would pay, you know, you're being paid to speak, you're being paid to consult. Then I would say that like, do yourself a favor, set aside the dollars, and, you know, commit yourself. And if you have to, you know, pick a date six months from now and invite all the people that you don't want to look stupid to, all your friends and clients and relationships to the launch party, because that was the only way that would have, that got me to commit and say, holy crap, I better get this thing done. I love that. The power of public accountability. <laughs> <laughs> and even just posting, I'm writing a book. Who's coming to my launch party six months from now? Um, that's great. John, this has been so great, man. Um, where can people go to find about find out more about you, the giftology uh, message, um, method to, to purchase the book, all that good stuff? Yeah. Well, I mean, the book you can get on Amazon. That's like the number one place by far. Um, but as far as, you know, consulting and gifting services, all that kind of stuff, giftology group. And if you want to follow me, I'm at, at John Woolen on, uh, on Instagram. Those are kind of the two places to, uh, to, uh, to track me down. Nice. And you said the place where they can go download uh, the kind of the, 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 the resource, what was it that you're yeah, at? Yeah. The, the, our entire playbook is, uh, is giftology system, uh, giftology system.com. Awesome. John, you're the man. Thank you. Chandler. It's been fun, brother. <laughs>